This week on Personally Speaking, our guest is Judge John Gleason, who's written a powerful book called The Gotti Wars. Please stay with us. Hello and welcome to Personally Speaking. I'm your host, Monsignor Jim Losanti, and John Gleason joins me now. Judge John Gleason has had a distinguished career as a federal prosecutor, federal judge, and practicing defense attorney. He was lead counsel in the successful racketeering murder trials of John Gotti and Vic Arena, respectively the bosses of the Gambino and Colombo crime families, for which he received the Attorney General's Distinguished Service Award. John Gleason's latest book is called The Gotti Wars. The subtitle is Taking Down America's Most Notorious Mobster. It's a memoir about what it took to bring America's star gangster to justice. The book comes 30 years after the guilty verdict, which ultimately took down five major mob families, effectively ending the American Mafia. John Gleason currently teaches at New York University School of Law, Harvard Law School, and Yale School of Law. He's here to talk to us today about his career, the values that sustain him, and the book, The Gotti Wars, a chronicle of good triumphing over evil. Joining me now, I'm so pleased to welcome to Personally Speaking, John Gleason. Judge Gleason, thank you so much for coming on Personally Speaking. Judge, my first question actually has little to do with the book, although I want to talk a lot about the book. But um, for those who don't know, Judge Gleason is the youngest of seven children uh, born in the Bronx. Could you tell us, just by way of understanding the community you come from, what kind of parents did you have, and when you look back, what did they do right? I had great parents. You know, my father was an off-the-boat Irishman, left uh, left Ireland at age 16 to come to the United States, worked in the mailroom at Metropolitan Life for many years. Mm-hmm. And uh, my mom is the daughter of Irish immigrants, and... Uh, they lived in the Edenwald section of the Bronx. And uh, I, as you mentioned, I'm the youngest of seven. When I was born, that meant nine of us in a two bedroom wow. apartment on Seton Avenue in the Bronx. Amazing. So when I was a baby, my father moved us out to a house in Valhalla up in Westchester County. Right. And whereas my older sisters had, had spent their childhoods in the Bronx, I spent my childhood up in Westchester County. Okay. Now, everyone who talks about you and all these articles about you talk about you being this man of rectitude and a a, a straight shooter. Are those values that you would have gotten from them? Oh, certainly. Yeah. My parents turned square corners. They were hardworking. (laughs) Yeah. Undereducated. You know, they had one high school degree between them. They took care of their kids. Their goal in life was to raise the seven kids and get them through college Mm. and they did you know they brought us to church and they taught us the right values and they were you know my brothers and sisters and i get together and we invariably end up talking about our parents who who were our you know beacons in life really isn't that terrific, though? Now, uh, go back for a second to uh, the purpose of our interview to talk about the Gotti Wars. When I mentioned to uh, some of our folks, you know, what we were talking about today, almost to a person, the biggest question they asked was, how do you, as a prosecutor, going after John Gotti, how do you sleep at night? <laughs> well, we work so hard, it was easy to sleep at night. <laughs> but, to, you know, to the, ex- to the extent the question is, were we afraid of them for yeah. our physical safety? We really weren't. You know, unlike the the mafia in Sicily, which truly is dangerous, and mm. at the time I was prosecuting the members of the Gambino family and other families, my counterparts in Sicily were being blown up um, yeah. by the mob. There, But there's a certain... Um, rule like an unwritten rule in in the u.s where the mob which is a business is not going to do something that's going to 
ignite all of law enforcement to turn its turrets on them. And there's nothing quite like retaliating against an agent or a prosecutor that would result in that. So mm. I'm not saying there are no exceptions, but the general rule is it's a business decision. We're not going to make our business that much more difficult to conduct by killing a prosecutor or an agent. Were you so doing that? Were you at that time in any way overly protective or trying to protect, uh, you know, your your dad and a husband at that point? Uh, did you worry about your family? I, I did, and the truth is, I, we started our family at age forty, so I uh, did not have kids. And oh. I've been asked. This is a really good question. I've been asked whether I would have gotten back in the ring for round two against John Gotti had my daughters come along already, and that might have been a different might have been a different calculus. Children, yeah. children just make you much more yeah. careful about everything. And I'm not sure I would have done that second case if I had my daughters were born. Now, in the, in the Gotti Wars, Judge Gleason uh, begins by uh, dedicating the book to a lot of people. And he says that his daughters and his stepsons are great and wonderful people. Judge, why are they great and wonderful people? Well, um, <laughs> they're patient and they... They put up with a very hardworking dad and, and stepfather. Yeah. You know, my daughters, you know, you, you've heard dads talk about their daughters. There's no relationship uh, in humanity quite like the closeness a father has for his daughters. And my kids were no exception. They grew up watching me. My One would be in her orchestra practice, and I was out there working on the Gotti book in the hallway. Another yeah. took classes on weekends at... <laughs> CW Post College out there in Long Island. Right. And for the three hours she was in her classes, I was working on the book. They've always closely identified me with writing that book. It took me a quarter century to write it. Anyway, they're wonderful. My stepsons are they're uh, very, you know, considering they're adolescent boys, one's now 19, they're very, very like low key and cool and fun to be around, <laughs> and they've accepted me into their lives with great grace. Now, this is, a, again, I promise to get back to the mafia in a second, but, Judge, I was impressed, because it's unusual from all the counseling I end up doing with people over the 42 years of being a priest. Um, the judge dedicates and gives thanks to his wife, but in an act of uh, very interesting graciousness to me, where I'm so unused to anyone speaking well of a, a former spouse, you also are immensely kind about your first wife. I just wondered where that kind of graciousness comes from. Oh, I, I don't know. The, the, in this context, in this manifestation, it just seems uh, completely natural to me. Yeah. You know, I had a 40-year marriage that ended, but we were very close for a long time, and my first wife, Susan, was incredibly supportive. Mm. at a time when she would have been fully justified in saying, what are you doing? Why are you <laughs> making such little, such little money and putting our physical security in danger? Yeah. So she deserved the thanks. I, it came from my heart, and she deserved the thanks that I gave her. Yeah. Well, you raised a question about her that I wanted to follow up with. Uh, for those who don't know, Judge Gleason was actually with a very successful and lucrative law firm when he decides to go into prosecuting these bad guys. And uh, I guess, now I say this kindly, I'm a chaplain for the Columbian Lawyers Association, so for over 30 years I've been very close to lawyers. My dad was an attorney. But, you know, making money is, is a big deal, and, uh, and it's not uncommon to, to want to make money. To walk away from that, to go into prosecution, especially the kind of prosecution you did, not just against the mafia, but terrorists. What went into your thought process about, I'm going to walk away from what could be a very lucrative and comfortable life and take on something that could be very risky? It's a great question. And, you know, we were supposed to be, my brothers and sisters and I were supposed to be priests and nuns. Ah. I'm the one who came closest because I did get to wear a robe and officiate <laughs> preside at wedding. Right. But, you know, I was as terrible as it was to lose my parents in my 20s. Mm. It, one silver lining was they were not around. You know, they, they knew the Depression. Yeah. And my mother knew the importance of, you know, a solid job and being able to care for your family. Yeah. So I was 
it was it was silver lining they weren't around when I cut my salary more in half more than in half yeah. when I left the big law firm to become a prosecutor but it was it was just a the professional pull to do work in the criminal arena was so so strong for me there was just no way I was um, not going to do it and again you know it goes back to my first wife Susan being utterly gracious about it you know you know, we were trying to make our way and buy a home in New York. We inherited nothing from our, mm-hmm. our parents. And she was like, go ahead, do what you want to do. And and I did. <laughs> you followed your, your calling and she was kind enough to go with it. In, right. in in the Gotti Wars, you get a lot into the personality of John Gotti. But I want to go into a different dimension, Judge, if I can. Um, you know, you and I are raised in the Christian faith and so was he. Uh, and I've seen enough pictures of these guys in the Cosa Nostra to see tons of uh, Christ heads around their neck and crosses. I'm just wondering, did you ever get any insight into, did John Gotti's faith of baptism, faith he was raised in, have any impact at all on the man in terms of living his life? Um, Certainly no positive impact, Father, (laughs) and there there was no sense in which the values that the church inculcated in me and my family um, registered even in the slightest in the actions of John Gotti. So, look, I don't profess to be the best Catholic around, but me neither. Me neither, Judge. What, everything is what you compare it to, and compared to him, I was you. <laughs> I thank you for that. <laughs> you know, you probably know that uh, uh, Pope Francis has, on a number of occasions, come out to speak specifically against the workings of the mafia. And you make me nervous when you talk about the fact that over in Sicily they take people out for doing things like that. Uh, are you in, at all encouraged by a Holy Father who says this is just plain evil? Yes, of course. Yeah, it's not said frequently enough. And yes, right. it's a. It's a good thing that the leader of the Catholic Church does that. It's among multiple good things Pope Francis has done for us. Now, you're able to send uh, uh, this John Gotti and others away to jail, uh, including people who had been committing acts of terror against the United States. I, my question would be, because uh, I, I wonder when I have parishioners who go off to jail, Judge, from your point of view, is there such a thing as true rehabilitation in in the prison system yes and i think to the degree that happens there's very little credit to be given to the prison system itself it's more coming from within um the inmates who decide so many people commit crimes in their youth, and by youth, I don't, I don't, I, I mean in their twenties, and mm-hmm. then they grow up, and yeah. there something yeah. happens. Is very little. One one um, one thing we need is better programming in our prison systems, federal and state. But in my experience, and I have a number of clients in a pro bono project in which that are I where I, which is devoted to getting sentence reductions for men who have been in for 10, 15, 20, sometimes 30 years. The people who don't believe that someone that who commits serious crimes as a young adult can't transform themselves, rehabilitate themselves into commendable and sometimes even admirable people, mm-hmm. just don't know what people are capable of. People are capable of growing up, having a something i wish i could identify it and bottle it because i see it in my clients you know something goes off and they decide okay i'm going to get myself ready for the rest of my life mm-hmm. so the day i walk out of here i'm going to make my children proud and my family yeah. proud and my community proud wow uh, i wish there was more of that judge for our guest uh, judge sean gleason is our guest the book is called the Gotti wars and uh um, you know, I mentioned to you earlier before the show an attorney friend named Bruce, uh, and uh, I mentioned Bruce because he he's an interesting guy in that he was at one time working for the DA of Nassau County, went off to the Jesuits for a while, Bruce Barquette's his name, and then came back and uh, got into defending the so-called bad guys. 
And I know he's gotten a lot of grief over the years from people who say, how could you, after working for the good guys, work for the bad guys? Now, in some ways, you, you've taken a parallel course. What, what's your thought behind, uh, at one level, trying to put all the bad guys away, and at another level saying, no, even the bad guys deserve the best representation possible? Sure. You know, and Bruce Barquette is a well-known attorney and an excellent one, has always been, and I count myself among his admirers. He has a uh, fabulous practice out there in Long Island, and yes. and please give him my regards. Will do. But, you know, and people who criticize criminal defense lawyers for doing what they do, I just think it doesn't mean they're bad people, but they, there's an insufficient understanding of the system of justice that we as a country, as a nation, mm -hmm. have chosen to adopt. You know, we have a world, our world in the U.S., where we've decided that people don't get punished unless the government, preserving all their, honoring all their rights, the individual's rights, can prove them guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I used to tell this when I was a judge to the people who wanted to plead guilty. They would say to me, I, I want to plead guilty because I am guilty. And I would say to them, wow. okay, I get it. But recognize we live in a world in which unless the government can prove you guilty to the satisfaction of a jury beyond a reasonable doubt, right. you're not going to be punished even if you are guilty. And look, I've been around the system now for 40 plus years. I have internalized that. We play roles. I played a role as a prosecutor. My job was to try to prove guilt. Mm -hmm. As a judge, I played a role to make sure everybody got a fair trial and their rights were respected. Right. Now I'm a defense lawyer. Some people, even the guilty people, need protection. They need their rights vindicated. And if the government can't prove them guilty, they should not be punished. If the government proves them guilty, they shouldn't be punished excessively. Those are roles that I think lay people ought to respect, all of those roles. You're not, by representing a criminal, you don't become one. Right, right, right. Uh, Judge Gleason's our guest. Judge, um, in the articles, if you read about you online, you know, you have many, many people who are uh, big supporters and, and appreciate what you do, but you have obviously other people who write, and one of the things that they accuse you of is way too lenient, you know. Uh, and I mentioned that about being lenient, especially in sentencing. You've seen, because you have worked as a prosecutor, some of the uh, ugliest dimensions of human behavior. Uh, certainly no one can read the Gotti Wars without scratching their head and say, what happened to these guys along the way to make them choose the road of, uh, of wrong that they did? I mentioned that because then you become a judge and they accuse you of being too lenient. I guess the expectation would be someone who's seen the dark side of human nature would certainly be a hanging judge and be very, very tough and not lenient. How do you explain the uh, what people perceive to be perhaps a disparity? Yeah, it's a good, it's a great question. Um, the disparity, you know, I, I spent 10 years as a prosecutor, as you've mentioned, and to my mind, you know, during that 10 years, our nation switched from, entered a new regime of, of sentencing from a, we call it an indeterminate regime where judges had a lot of discretion to a determinate regime intended to restrict judges' discretion. Okay. And that became a much more severe in terms of sentence length uh, state of affairs. As far as I'm concerned, I spent my 10 years as a prosecutor investigating mm -hmm. and prosecuting and convicting the narrow slice of the caseload that actually deserved yeah. the severity that our system dishes out because they were engaged in violent crime. Yeah. Now, I go on the bench and the spectrum of federal criminal defendants is very wide and it runs from a bank teller who's a single mom stealing $300 from the account to an addict who commits an, a nonviolent drug trafficking offense mm -hmm. to a business person who commits insider trading. So there's a, to my, I'll, the way I'll put it is there's a spectrum of culpability, a spectrum of the severity of the conduct. Mm -hmm. And I believe our system doesn't grade the punishment in a way that is as nuanced 
perceived as the behavior that we're punishing. I think we punish, I haven't hidden my light under a bushel. Right. I think we punish nonviolent drug offenders way too severely. Yeah. We punish low level folks who have committed fraud. I'm not saying their crimes should be excused. I'm not saying they shouldn't be punished, but we put them in prison for too long a time and it tears apart their families and it tears apart their communities. I care deeply about that. Yeah. Some people have different views and they criticize my views. That's fine. Yeah. Judge Gleason is our guest. Judge, you know, uh, when people read The Gotti Wars, if they have forgotten already, they'll have to hear that uh, you went through this prosecution of John Gotti and the first time out were not successful and we know why, because of a, a corrupt juror. But I mention that because I just wondered how, uh, how does John Gleason handle it when you do devote so much energy, so much caring, so much work and research, and then it goes south. Like, how do you handle this appointment? Not, not well. <laughs> <laughs> Friday, the 13th of March, 1987, after a seven-month trial, the trial lawyer is in the crowd, will understand what kind of a grueling, yeah. uh, a grueling uh, experience a seven-month trial is. All defendants acquitted of all charges in the most high profile, most highly followed in terms of the press case in our in really in in federal criminal justice history. And we were devastated. Yeah. We were blown away. It, I was licking my wounds mm. for months after that yeah. and was given an opportunity to um, to claw my way back and to mm. do additional cases. And five years later, um, be the lead prosecutor in the second case. Yeah. But it was I, I wish that I had at the time the equanimity to just let that roll off me like duck off a of, uh, water off a duck's <laughs> right, back. Right. But it did it didn't. It decimated <laughs> me and my trial counsel. That's as honest as could be, Judge. So thank you for that. I'd be shocked if you didn't react that way. Um I, I did a wedding judge, uh, a guy named Dave, wonderful guy, and uh then for a while I was waiting for him and his lovely wife Lauren to have children and uh, it was delayed, delayed, delayed. So I finally said to him over dinner, where are the babies? And he said, uh, you should know this about my, my family. My father was a hitman for the mob. And he said, I I'm nervous about bringing life into the world. He said, uh, I don't know that this isn't genetic, this, this evil inclination that made my father re admit to 11 killings. Um, and of course, I would say to him, no, you know, each of us makes our own choice and stuff. But for, for the family of uh, people like the Gottis, is it easy to get out from under? Wow, that's a that's a, a really interesting vignette you just described. For the family, um, you know, I, I can only, from a distant perspective, like guess at it. I will mm -hmm. say this: my sister Mary was married to John Gotti's first cousin, uh -huh. um, and uh, which was a kind of a revelation to me during <laughs> yeah. the first case, and. You know, it's not easy generally. John Gotti had a very rough and tumble upbringing in the mm. East New York East, East New York section of the city, and you know, for guys like him who grew up in those very rough neighborhoods, were there as many opportunities as there were f for me growing up uh, in in Westchester County? Probably not. I'd like to end by thanking uh, John Gleason for being with us. In the legal community, he's much respected for his tenacity, for his fairness, for his leniency as well. You know, not too long ago, I had the opportunity with my sainted mom to watch the trilogy of The Godfather. And the truth is, sometimes we have, in America and around the world, romanticized these folks who uh, basically make their life, build their life around crime and hurting people and taking advantage of situations. So it takes a, an unusually brave, strong, and tenacious person to say, uh, I believe justice is on our side, and I will do whatever I have to to put the mob away, because it is exploiting, hurting, damaging, in fact, killing people. Um, what, what a risky, risky business it was for John Gleason to be the lead prosecutor, not once but twice, in going after John Gotti and the mob families that ultimately he was victorious in putting away. I'm so glad that he's decided now, some years later, to put together a book called The Gotti Wars. I think for many of us, uh, we sometimes, again, even with the, with the Don, romanticize him because he was a snappy dresser and had a style. 
And yet, it's important that John Gleason takes us through the experience of, of the crime family and what they have meant to our world and why it was vitally important, not once but twice, even after the betrayal of the first trial when one of the jurors turned out to have been bought off by the mob, that John was willing five years later, after all that discouragement he talked about in our interview, to be able to try again and to devote his life and to put aside his personal life so that he could try his best to bring justice to an unjust situation. And thank God he succeeded and uh, John Gotti was finally sent to prison and the mob was truly brought down because of the work of John Gleason. He's written a powerful book. I hope uh, our listeners and viewers will get it, The Gotti Wars. Um, but I thank, more importantly, John Gleason for what he does in terms of his work, both as a prosecutor, more recently as a judge and as a defense attorney. He's a good, honorable, hardworking, fair man, and uh, we need to have more people in public life like him. I'm certain that it costs him. He shared that with us as well, that uh, when you give your life over to justice and the justice system, if you really do, it's going to cost you so much. It's why he... Uh, went out of his way to be gracious in the book to thank his first wife. Even though he knew that, uh, you know, the marriage didn't work, he appreciated what she put into the raising of the family so that he could do the work of, of, uh, of justice. I'm grateful to John Gleason and to you for being with us on Personally Speaking. I'm Monsignor Jim Losanti. We'll be with you again soon on Personally Speaking. As we end today's program, I want to thank you all for being with us. If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to me at personallyspeakingpodcast at gmail.com. To listen to this show or other episodes, go to YouTube and search under Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Losanti, where you'll be able to watch our shows as well. And don't forget, please, to hit like and subscribe. Personally Speaking is also on Facebook at Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Losanti, and we're now also on Instagram at Personally Speaking Podcast. Please share and let others know about Personally Speaking. I'm privileged to serve as host and executive producer, Personally Speaking. Our producer is Lisa Janovitz. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be with you again next time on Personally Speaking.